Labą dieną. Garbus konferencijos dalyviai ir žiūrovai esantį šią Vilniaus rotušę salėje ir savintis vaizdo transliaciją. So, hello, we are starting our second day of our conference. Bei Lietuvos istorijos institutų.facebook.pro filija. And this is being streamed in the Facebook in English. So, we are opening the second day of the conference called the called the divisive past of the Soviet German war and narrative of mass violence in Eastern Central Europe. The conference is being sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the, the um, Faculty of History of Vilnius University and the Institute of History. Uh, allow me to uh, remind you of what we, we had uh, achieved in this conference. Yesterday, the, the conference was divided into several sections, and uh, uh, there were numerous presentations that contributed to our understanding of the general narrative. Uh, of, of the processes that took place in the first years uh, uh, of the Second World War. So, so second, Section 1 covered the topics on the uh, uprising of 1941 and uh, was dedicated to analysis on different events and processes at the same time, concluding uh, at the same time of how much is still outstanding and how much uh, there is a uh, uh, um, space for uh, research on the part of historians to understand the reasons and consequences. Uh, the sec section two is uh, uh, covered the covered the um, events in Eastern Europe in 1941, was dedicated for our attempt to uh, demonstrate and. Uh, and recollect on the uh, uh, events in the, the summer of 1941 and the memory of many participants, uh, how the events were covered. Um, events were covered in their diaries and um, uh, recorded in different texts, uh, contributing to the two historians uh, in their attempts to interpret to interpret the events of the time. So having shortly um, um, reminded of what uh, was achieved yesterday uh, working on our Zoom platform. I am here uh, have an honor to pre present Section 3, Section 3 of our conference, uh, which I'm going to be the moderator. And the uh, name of the section is the the historical evolution, uh, war and holocaust between remembrance and forgetting. So we are here uh, trying to present a general picture of the understanding and their contribution to the general understanding of uh, historical images and how different societal groups participate in the dialogue and seeking to uh, help us to understand how we have to remember today the, the war, the Holocaust, the uprising and different uh, forms of resistance uh, to the German Nazi regime in Eastern Europe. Uh, section 3 of the conference uh, will be inviting to speak both live and on Zoom platform uh, scientists and researchers from Germ from um, America, uh, Hungary. So we have a pretty diversified international panel, and uh, I'm here happy to present the first. Uh, 
um, presenter uh, whose um, uh, uh, presentation was recorded. Uh, and that is David Fishman, that's a historical uh, historian uh, living in America, the, with a specialization in the history of uh, European Jews. I, is uh, the author of the book about the Jews in Vilnius Ghetto. The book was translated into Lithuanian. Uh, and at the time it was published in English, it was awarded the National um, Jewish Book uh, category, um, Book Award in Holocaust category. So uh, we are now. Uh, you are now welcome to uh, watch this uh, presentation. Participate immediately after the war, how Jews attempted to commemorate the events of the Holocaust in Vilnius right after the war. And uh, I will be mainly showing you slides as I speak. When the city of Vilnius was liberated from German occupation, on July 13th, 1944, there were virtually no Jews in the city. In the course of the next few years, Jews flocked into Vilnius from hiding places and partisan units in the forests, from evacuation in Central Asia, and from liberated Nazi concentration camps. In addition, Soviet Jews from Russia and Belarus also settled in the city. By 1946, there were roughly 9,000 Jews in Vilnius, approximately 7% of the city's total population. The Jewish population reached a peak of 16,000 in the 1959 census. One of the arriving Jews' priorities was to memorialize the pre-war Vilna Jewish community and to commemorate the suffering, mass murder, and armed resistance of their brethren. This natural desire to commemorate was, however, difficult to realize because Vilnius was now under Soviet rule. Cultural life in general, and Jewish cultural life in particular, were controlled by the authorities. Public memory of the war years was an important topic, ideologically, <coughs> And it needed to conform to a Soviet patriotic formula. And part of that formula was the claim that all Soviet nationalities had suffered equally under German occupation. And that the mass murder of the Jews should not be singled out from the suffering of other uh, peaceful Soviet citizens. Some early official publications uh, passed over the Holocaust in Vilnius altogether. For example, the interim report of the Lithuanian SSR's Extraordinary State Commission to study the atrocities by the Germans and their accomplices, the CGK, the Czeswiczajnia Gasudarstvenia Komisja, this interim report, which was published in booklet form in 1945, and its section on Panerai uh, wrote, I quote, among the victims, there were scholars and workers, engineers and students, Catholic priests and Russian Orthodox priests. On certain bodies, objects of religious worship from the Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches were found. There was no mention of Jews who constituted the majority of those murdered at Panirai. Under the newly established Soviet regime, 
there were only three public Jewish institutions in Vilnius. The synagogue, the Jewish children's combine, which brought together an orphanage, a kindergarten, and a five-year school, and Jewish museum. The authorities rejected requests to establish a Yiddish newspaper, a Yiddish magazine, publishing house, theater, radio broadcasts, a Jewish committee, or a Jewish workers' club. The synagogue and the museum both engaged in commemorative activity, most of the time separately and differently, since they represented different segments of the Jewish community, and also because they had different legal statuses and social positions. But sometimes these two institutions worked quietly together. The synagogue, which was initially headed by the young Rabbi Israel Gustman, who was the only surviving member of the pre-war Vilna rabbinate, uh, the synagogue organized the first public memorial gathering at Panerai on September 20th, 1944, which was Tzom Gedalia, which is a day of fasting and mourning on the Jewish religious calendar. This gathering bore a mixed religious secular character with men covering their heads in accordance with religious tradition and the recitation of traditional memorial prayers while the crowd stood around one of the open pits. But the gathering was also addressed by two surviving members of Vilnius, Vilnius's uh, secular Jewish intelligentsia, the medical physician, Dr. Alexander Libo, and the poet Shmerke Kaczerginski. And the latter, the secular intelligentsia speakers, both called upon Jews to take up arms to defeat the enemy in the ranks of the Red Army and to take revenge against known local murderers. Many of the synagogue's routine religious services during the course of the year were in fact in part Holocaust commemorations because synagogue attendance shot up on those religious holidays when memorial prayers for the dead were recited. Jews attended those services not so much to pray as to pay their respects to their murdered loved ones. The synagogue seems to have had greater freedom in organizing public Holocaust commemorations than the Jewish Museum did. Thus, the synagogue organized a funeral and burial of desecrated Torah scrolls and Torah scroll fragments in May 1945, which attracted more than 100 people. This event, the burial of the Torah scrolls, featured a ceremony at the Choral Synagogue on Pili Mostri, a procession through the ghetto with a stop at the building of the Great Synagogue, where eulogies were given, and from there to the Zarece Ujupis Jewish Cemetery, where burial and recitation of prayers took place. Because religious study and religious book culture had constituted such a prominent feature of Jewish life in pre-Holocaust Vilnius, the burial of the Torah scrolls, of these desecrated Torah scrolls, was a kind of funeral for the spiritual aspect of the Jerusalem of Lithuania itself. Meanwhile, secular public events on the Holocaust faced much firmer bureaucratic opposition. In July 1946, a group of former uh, <clears throat> Jewish partisans tried to organize with the Jewish Museum a program in memory of Itzik Wittenberg, the martyred commander of the FPO, that is the underground armed resistance in the Vilnius ghetto. The purpose of this public program was to recount the struggles of the FPO and of its fallen heroes. Now Wittenberg sh uh, should have been a perfect candidate for Soviet glorification since he was a devoted communist and a leader of the underground communist party under the German occupation. But the first secretary of the Vilnius Committee of the Communist Party, the Gorkom, Chistyakov, politely rejected these former partisans' request. And he explained 
that singling out the struggle of one nationality was unacceptable in the Soviet Union. Only an internationalist program on the partisans of all nationalities was permissible. From that point on, the Jewish Museum refrained from sponsoring public programs on the Holocaust. The museum was much more successful at commemorating the Holocaust through its permanent exhibition, which it began to mount at the end of 1945. <clears throat> the exhibit was at first entitled, quote, German Mass Murder on Lithuanian Soil and Resistance to the Occupation. And it was later renamed much more succinctly, Fascism is Death. This exhibit evolved and grew over time uh, and it eventually spread um, over seven rooms. Fascism is Death, we can reconstruct this exhibit from descriptions in the Yiddish press at that time, both the Moscow Yiddish press and the American Yiddish press, from memoirs of staff members of the Jewish Museum and of visitors, and most importantly, from more than 100 photographs of this exhibit taken by the museum's director, Janko Gutkovich. These photographs were given to me by Gutkovich's daughter, Dina Gutkovich Krusin, who lives in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. The basic structure of this exhibit is clear. The largest display room was dedicated to the Vilnius ghetto. A second room dealt with Panirai and the labor camps in Estonia to which Jews were deported. Yet another room was devoted to the Kovna Kaunas ghetto, the Ninth Fort and other ghettos in Lithuania. <clears throat> there were smaller areas dedicated to German atrocities across Europe, including the death camp in Auschwitz, Majdanek, Treblinka. Finally, there was a room dedicated to the struggle of Jewish partisans against the Nazis and Jewish uh, fighters in the Red Army. So the exhibit <clears throat> featured a large number of text panels with narratives and chronologies on the history of the Vilnius and Kaunas ghettos in three languages, Yiddish, Russian, and Lithuanian. Fascism is death <clears throat> is an extremely rare instance of public education on the Holocaust in the Soviet Union a country where the Jewish genocide was usually downplayed in public discourse and was usually merged into the broader category of the suffering of the Soviet people. In Fascism is Death, the focus was squarely on the fate of the Jews. In this con context, I want to point out two key features of this exhibit. First, it fused the Jewish Holocaust narrative with the Soviet war narrative. Uh, the exhibit exuded with Soviet patriotism and celebrated the Red Army and Communist Party. Writing in the Moscow Yiddish newspaper, Einikait, Gutkovich, the museum's director, explained the message he hoped visitors would extract from the exhibit. And I quote, as one walks from room to room, one is overcome with a feeling of passionate love and profound gratitude to the Red Army and to Soviet power, which rescued us from destruction and which now leads us to a new full-blooded life. The exhibit stressed the leading role of the Communist Party in the armed resistance to the German occupation. It, the exhibit, lavished attention on Itzik Wittenberg, the first commander of the FBO, the Ghetto Underground. And it celebrated Sonia Madeisker and Chaim Yellen, communists who were leaders of the Jewish armed resistance in Vilnius and Kaunas. The text panel on Wittenberg <coughs> falsely claimed that the resistance in Vilnius was organized by the Communist Party. There was no mention in the exhibit of Wittenberg's successor as commander of the FPO, Abba Kovner, who was a leader of the socialist Zionist Shomer Atzair organization, or for that matter of any other FPO leaders who were Zionists or Bundists, Bundists being Jewish social democrats. Integral to this merging of the Holocaust with the Soviet war narrative was the exhibit's primary focus 
on the Holocaust in Soviet Lithuania. And then its secondary focus on other parts of the Soviet Union. European countries outside the USSR, <clears throat> including Poland, were given very scant attention. <clears throat> this exhibit began with the German attack on the Soviet Union in June 1941 not with the German invasion of Poland in September 1939. For atrocities across the Soviet Union, the exhibit featured images collected and given on loan by the Soviet Jewish writer Ilya Ehrenburg. Uh, while there was also a photo montage on Auschwitz and items from Treblinka donated by uh, the Soviet Jewish writer Vasily Grossman, there was no narrative, there was no text panels about uh, Auschwitz and Treblinka. The viewer either knew or had to guess that there was a comprehensive Nazi final solution to the Jewish question because it was not mentioned. The curators could not talk about the Holocaust as a pan-European phenomenon because that would be wading into politically perilous territory. Any reference to the Jews of Europe as a single entity which shared a common fate would have been an impermissible expression of Jewish nationalism in the USSR. Now, a second major feature of fascism is death was its immediate proximity to the events. This exhibit was opened in late 1945, and the rawness of the curator's emotions. The Jewish Museum, this museum, was located within the territory of the former Vilna Ghetto at 6 Strashun Street. The main building, which was now the Jewish Museum, had functioned as the ghetto library which was the cultural and social hub or focal point for ghetto inmates. In front of the building, there was a cleared away area, which was used as the ghetto sports field. And there was an attached adjacent wing, which was the ghetto prison, many of whose arrestees were seized by the Germans and sent to their deaths in Panirai. So the history of the Vilna ghetto, the Vilnius ghetto, was encapsulated in the address of the museum, 6 Strashun Street, which now became the museum. In fact, during the first months of the museum's existence, the only place, the only rooms in usable condition were the prison cells. And those became the staff offices. Gutkovich, the director, and his staff worked in the cells whose, war, whose walls bore handwritten inscriptions by prison inmates. Tomorrow we'll be taken to Ponar, Panerai. Take revenge for the innocent blood. Truth will prevail. Down with Gens. The inscriptions were photographed and some of them were displayed in the exhibit hall, which was just a few dozen meters away. Now, Fascism is Death, this exhibit was far less inhibited than later Holocaust exhibits uh, throughout the world because the curators had no aesthetic or moral compunctions just to display items that would nowadays be rejected because they elicit revulsion or they violate the dignity of the victims. The exhibit <coughs> displayed in a case a woman's skull from Ponar, Panirai, with a bullet hole in the back of her head. In the next room, there was a bar of soap, which the exhibit reported was produced from the fat of murdered Jews at a factory in Danzig. Another featured item was the text of a letter written on the train to Panirai by two members of a large group of Jews who had been in hiding and their hiding place was discovered in 1944, several months before the ghetto's liquidation. Um, uh, I'm sorry, several months after the ghetto's liquidation. The group included women and children, and the letter uh, gave graphic descriptions of the gang rape of young girls by German soldiers and Lithuanian policemen in the presence of their mothers. 
and it described the mutilation of male sexual organs with wires and rods. Now, the exhibit not only displayed this letter, originally a Polish language letter, but it also provided panels around the display with full translations of its text into Russian, Yiddish, and Lithuanian, including the descriptions of rape and sexual mutilation. By contrast, when this letter was published in a book in New York in Yiddish in 1947, the editors deleted those passages and gave an explanatory note, I quote from the New York book, we cannot bring the next lines because one cannot put in print the sadistic sexual practices of the German murderers and degenerates toward children. The curators of fascism, fascism is death were filled with a passion to expose the vile nature of the Germans' crimes. And this passion was unchecked by any other considerations. They wanted to shock their audience. And that was a tall order since the viewers of this exhibit had themselves witnessed death and brutality during the war years. Uh, staff member Alexander Rinzunski, a former ghetto inmate and a former FPO fighter, <coughs> served as the museum's tour guide. <coughs> and Rinzunski reported in his memoirs that many of the viewers of this exhibit were visitors from other parts of the Soviet Union, Jews and non-Jews from Moscow, Leningrad, Kharkov, and elsewhere. Non-Jewish uh, visitors expressed astonishment at the Germans' crimes against the Jewish people, saying that they had never heard or read of them in the Soviet press. Among the VIP uh, prominent visitors to this exhibit were the president of uh, Soviet Lithuania, Justas Paletskis, and the director of the Moscow State Yiddish Theater, Solomon Michoels. Once memorializing the destruction of Lithuanian Jewry became the Jewish Museum's primary objective, this mission led the museum to go beyond its own four walls and concern itself with the mass murder at Panirai, the mass murder site at Panirai. On July 27, 1946, the museum's director, Yanko Gutkovich, and the five members of the museum's board sent a memorandum about Panerai to Paretkis and other Lithuanian Soviet officials. The memo noted that more than 100,000 Soviet citizens had been killed there, 70,000 of whom were Jews. Panerai is dear to thousands of people, I'm quoting, because of the innocent blood and their family member, of their family members and dear ones that was spilt there. The memo called on the Council of Ministers of the Lithuanian SSR to build fences around the mass murder pits in order to stop ongoing scavenging and looting at the site. It urged the authorities to place a memorial sign immediately and eventually erect a monument there. Paleskis was sympathetic to the museum's proposal and helped arrange a meeting between a representative of the museum and Deputy Prime Minister of the Lithuanian SSR, Girdvainis. At the meeting, the museum submitted a detailed proposal for a monument with a budget and architectural plans. Girdvainis left the room to consult with Prime Minister Mitislovas Gidvilas in private. When he returned, he thanked the museum for its initiative and promised to convene a consultation on the matter of Panirai but the consultation never took place. This meeting was a polite brush off. The museum's entreaties failed to bear fruit, but they did set into motion a dynamic which eventually led to success. After a year of government inaction, the Jewish religious community, the synagogue, <coughs> entered the fray and took up this failed cause. It applied to the Council for the Affairs of Religious Cults and requested authorization to put in order the mass graves at Panirai and to construct a monument there. The synagogue argued that Panirai was a Jewish cemetery and that the construction of a tombstone on the grave of loved ones was a religious duty. 
This request was eventually approved in May 1948, and the monument was erected in August of 1948. Its text of this uh, Jewish uh, monument of Panirai from 1948 was in Yiddish, Hebrew, and Russian, and it specified that it was in memory of the Jews murdered by the German fascists. It invoked the biblical verse on the murder of Abel by his brother Cain, the voice of the innocent's blood cries out from the ground. There was no hammer and sickle, no Soviet star. This was a Jewish tombstone, not a Soviet monument. The Jewish Museum in Vilnius was dissolved as part of the campaign that liquidated all Jewish cultural institutions in the Soviet Union uh, during the final years of Stalin's rule. All Jewish cultural institutions in the Soviet Union were liquidated in 1949. In January 1949, the Minister of State Security of the Lithuanian SSR wrote a memo on the peril of Zionism and Jewish nationalism in Soviet Lithuania. In this memo, the Minister of State Security condemned the Jewish Museum's exhibit for its one-sided, quote-unquote, uh, presentation. He claimed the, the exhibit created the impression that only Jews fought against the German occupiers, while Lithuanian nationalists actively participated in the atrocities against Jews. This was a patently false characterization of the exhibit, but it served its purpose. The museum was ordered closed on June 10th, 1949. Quite remarkably, and in stark contrast to events in Moscow and Kiev, none of the Vilnius Jewish Museum staff members were arrested. Kutkovich, the director, found employment as a haircut norm regulator, who checked that barbers filled out their quotas of haircuts according to the five-year plan. The Jewish monument at Panirai, erected in 1948, was dynamited by the authorities in 1952. It was replaced by a new monument with a Soviet star on top and a brief inscription in Russian and Lithuanian to the victims of fascist terror. There was no Yiddish, no Hebrew, no mention of Jews. The work of the Vilnius Jewish Museum and of the synagogue to commemorate the Holocaust had been undone. From that point on, the Holocaust became a matter of private memory and not of public commemoration. Thank you, and I wish you. Ačiū labai, profesoriui David Fishman, jūs girdėjote jo pranešimą Holokausto Vilniuje atmintis žydų bendruomenėje 1944-1949 metais. Ir šis pranešimas leidžia geriau suprasti, kaip ir kodėl in Vilnius, and this presentation uh, allows us to understand better why uh, the history of Holocaust was uh, hidden behind uh, the curtain uh, saying that uh, the events uh, during the Second World War <clears throat> uh, affected all the people uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, not only uh, people of Jewish nationality. Uh, so this only shows how the, the history was distorted or hidden. hidden. And now I am inviting Professor Andrzej Zbichowski is the uh, research fellowship of Warsaw uh, University, uh, uh, mostly studying the history of um, Polish Jews. He was speaking about uh, the case of Poland and, uh, until 19. 
At first, I'd like to, to thank for the organizer to, to give the opportunity to come here to Vilnius the first time after the pandemic. I'm very grateful. And they asked me to submit the paper in English, so I did and do. And I will talk about um, the new research and changing the research uh, in Polish in the last Polish books about the destruction of Polish Jews and about the Polish-Jewish relationship during the years of Nazi occupation and what changed since uh, 1989. Over the part quarter of century, the topic of the ordinary poll as a witness of the Holocaust has been discussed in at least 50 major historical monographs written by Polish authors, a great number of collective works, numerous post-conference reports, and about uh, 16 substantial volumes of um, Zagwada Żydów, uh, Holocaust of the Jews, produced by Center of Holocaust and uh, the Destruction of Jews by uh, a section of Polish Academy of Science. It's also necessary to mention that before also several books uh, were published after the end of the war by historian from Jewish Historical Commission and Jewish Historical Institute and hundreds of articles in Bulletin of Jewish Historical uh, Institute. Today is um, a quarterly of Polish Jews. This has certainly greatly increased our knowledge of the changing situation of the Jewish population under the German occupation on the actual course of the Holocaust itself and on Polish-Jewish relations during the occupation. Above all, there is no space enough to discuss all the debates, and I mention only a few very important, uh, the most important books. Above all, there is, uh -huh. one detail, however, is certain. The Polish historical community, often with the assistance of representatives of other disciplines in the humanities, has not slept through the last decades and to the extent that this was possible has taken the opportunity to depoliticize Poland's recent history in the area that interests us, an opportunity that became possible only after the change of 89. It had a great influence on the relative increase in interest of the Holocaust among Polish society and on the Jewish war tragedy. In the first post-war decades, the aforementioned tragedy was of interest almost exclusively to the relatives and descendants uh, of the victims, the truth about extermi extermination camps, deportation, mass execution, and above about betrayal or indifference of the part of Polish neighbors practically did not leave the Jewish circles. My goal in this paper is to, the, to show the newest Polish historical writing focused mainly, although not exclusively, on assessing Polish-Jewish relations during the years of the Second War. Simply put, uh, I will talk uh, about the attitudes of the Poles, of the underground institution and the emigre government to their fellow countrymen, the Jews and their destruction, as well as their own self-assessment as to what extent Polish citizens succeeded in evading the obligation imposed by the Nazi occupier to collaborate and cooperate in the destruction of their Jewish fellow countrymen. Uh, at the beginning, I might add that the category of witness, so-called bystander to the Holocaust, invented by, in the 60s by Raoul Hilbert, is now often challenged, and not only by Polish historian. In paper, I quoted the opinion of Omar Bartov, who speaks that it, was, it wasn't possible to be absolutely bystanders and... Okay, I will be talk later about this. The debates mentioned by me can be dated back to 1985 when Claude Lanzmann produced his film Shoah. And when, uh, out of nine hour film, Polish public television selected less than 60 minutes of footage showing his Polish respondents as heartless, bloodthirsty barbarians. Now, 
Two years later, Jan Błoński published in the Guardian Powszechny his disturbing essay, Biedni Polacy patrzą na ghetto, dealing with the pervasive indifference during the occupation on the part of Poles to the murder of their Jewish fellow countrymen. In year 1994, saw a, a controversial article by Michał Cichy in Gazeta Wyborcza on the murder of several scores of Jews by insurgents in the Warsaw Uprising in 1944. Uh, and, on the first, uh, and this year uh, had placed the first academic publication devoted to Kielce program. However, the watershed came in 2001 with the publicizing of the issue of Jedwabne, mainly due to the reception of Jan Tomasz Gross' book Neighbors. The following two years saw the publication of more than 2,000 newspaper articles and subjects of relation between Poles and Jews during the occupation. Paweł Masewicz will uh, be talking about the Jedwabno case in the second session today. Uh, nevertheless, the years 2000-2002 seem to me to have been a watershed in a setting in completely new direction of research. By degree, we began to include in our research an unknown and perhaps unacknowledged but of sources hidden in the archives, as well as to develop new methodological assumptions. In terms of sources, research into the Edwabne affair resulted in the discovery of court cases and investigation connected with the issue 1944 August decree, I quote, on punishing war criminals and traitors of the Polish nations. Now, in other words, trained wartime collaborators. Detailed analysis of this material revealed that the substantial majority of uh, investigation and trials were not political in nature and did not involve members of the wartime pro London resistance movement, but quite ordinary town and country dwellers who, for various reasons, has decided to collaborate with the Nazi occupier. Some 10 up to 20 percent of these cases had a Jewish angle, including participation in German roundups, denunciation, theft of property, of taking part in the killing of people who were in hiding. Furthermore, the accused were not for the most part local official or Polish blue policemen, but ordinary farmers with families. Put simply, and paraphrasing the word of Polish emissary to London, Jan Karski, you know, Bohater, a uh, hero of my, uh, one of my books, we became aware of the narrow path of Polish German cooperation during the occupation, directed against Polish Jews. Hence, we began to study negatives from the occupation. Not everyone did so, of course. The president indicates he training the community of uh, pre-modern historian to present the subject of Polish-Jewish relation during the occupation solely, solely in terms of the Polish people's support, mass support of persecuted Jews. This purported assistance was usually characterized uh, as uh, disinterest and always heroic because of constant threats, death sentences, the help being widely supported in the underground Zagota, the Council for Assistance of Jews. In those years, there was no place for the examination of shameful, let alone criminal attitudes and behavior. In paper, I enumerate a few of these books, starting from very discussed uh, book uh, directed by, uh, collected, source material collected by Władysław Bartoszewski and Zofia Levin, then is the Uczyzny Moi. The first edition was in 66, the, the second 69. And after a few of uh, different people published the book about the Polish writers among the nations. This current of historical thought had not died, although Also, it has not flourished greatly since the debate of the Edwabn. Uh, here I mention also the no, no less controversial book by Gunnar Paulson, so-called Utajone Hidden uh, State, Utajone Miasto Żydzi Paryjskiej Stronie Warszawy, 1940-45. Paulson claims that quite a high number of Jews were uh, hiding in 
in the Aryan side, altogether 28,000 uh, and 17,000 before the outbreak of Warsaw Uprising uh, in 44, of whom 9,000 were under the direct care of aid organization, and that many Poles were involved in aid about 100,000 people. Uh, in Polson view, three quarters of so-called individual selfless acts went undocumented, not to mention that in addition, why Poles certainly could easily recognize assimilated Jews, concealing themselves, themselves under a Polish identity, they did not turn them into the occupying forces with the exception of a rather narrow group of extortionists, so-called Schmalzownicy, whose actions led to the death of about 4,000 Jews. The occupying forces, Germans, on their own initiative, captured a similar number of Jews hiding in the city, in different types of roundups. Paulson optimic optimistically assesses reality under the occupation, writing that networks of contacts on which Jews relied wove themselves into different shapes, creating a single hidden city, a quote of whose existence the Germans were completely unaware. Uh, Submitting up this aspect of Polish historical writing, I may add that um, it continues, although it not, it's not too popular. We may say that up to the year 2000, so-called Polish witnesses to the Holocaust were for most part perceived to be the righteous people fighting German terror tactics and willing to help those in danger. They were supposedly many, many more were noted in underground documents and postwar accounts. The remaining Poles were supposedly equally supportive to Jews, also owing the anti-Polish regime of terror and fearful for their own families, they remained passive. However, no mention was made of collaboration with Nazi occupier, even if collaboration was caused by fear in achieving the complete liquidation of the Jewish population. As historians began to uncover the growing number of examples of hostile behavior on the part of the Polish population towards Jews, both during the time of the ghettos and during the mass deportation, when there were a great many attempts to escape, ahead of deportation to that camp, the number of supporters of continuing the martyrological narrative has systematically dwindled. Only clearly defined uh, proponents of Polish nationalistic tradition have persevered, focusing mainly uh, on the nationalist underground movement and the most recent history of the Catholic Church. The leaders of this group are Jan Żarin, an American historian of Polish descent, Marek Jan Chodakiewicz. They are both associated with Fronda as well with Glaukopis, a publication that had raised mainly to rehabilitate unconditionally the wartime activities of the Narodowej with Zbrojne. The manifesto of this narrow and often attacked group has been Rodakiewicz's very controversial book, Żydzi i Polacy, 1918-1955, Spółistnienie Zagłada Komunis. Only one uh, remark. If we were to use just one descriptor, we would call this strength of writing the school of parity, since the key to these people's writings is an interchangeable applied selection of examples of good and reprehensible, and reprehensible behavior by both Poles and Jews during the Second War. Uh, in paper, as there's also the, the other um, school uh, or narrative about the so-called Jewish betrayal of the eastern borderlands during the first Soviet occupation. I published also one book about this uh, titled Organizi Dwabnego, and I'm, <clears throat> I stress uh, that somewhat limited uh, scope of strict collaborationist attitude of Jews in the Kress, apart from rather obvious expression of indifference towards Poland's loss of independence, pointing out to the economic basis of the growing Polish-Jewish conflicts. 
This influence was to a certain extent an attempt to mask fear of the Soviet authorities, but it's also derived from a conviction held by many Jews that Poland had let them down, especially with <coughs> the deeply anti-Semitic anti -Semitic atmosphere in the 1930s. Okay, writing about Jews and Polish underground states started by to be a separate trend in historical writing is based on a common topic and database. The eminent American historian David Engel, uh, author of two volumes study on the Polish government in exile, uh, at best indifferent attitude toward the, the mother of the Jewish population in Polish soil, now Engel raised the bar very high for this branch of Polish historiography on the Holocaust, a topic that developed starting delay. The second in this discussion was Darius Stoller with his book about Ignacy Schwarzbart, and the last word uh, was the, the final word in the discussion is Adam Puławski, two books, Wobliczu Zagłady and Wobec Niespotykanego Mordo. It's not enough time to, to, to describe these books, but it's one of the very popular <coughs> issues. What connects all these works is the status of Poles as conscious witnesses of the mass murder of their uh, Jewish neighbors. All frankly, with no further discussion, accept the idea that not much more could have been uh, done to save the Jewish population since the underground authorities did not want to allow fugitives from the ghettos into their ranks. With such an extent of anti-Semitic prejudice, supporting operations to help the ghettos as they were being liquidated were too risky and volunteers could not be found. It has also hard to take action against black mayors uh, who perhaps were numerous. Writers avoid answering the question about whether the Polish population on a large scale simply observed the deportation of the Jews to their death or perhaps also accepted it. The process of uh, uncovering further Polish crimes against Jews during the Second War, War War moved like an avalanche after the publication in 2001 of Gross Account of the Development continues to this day. I doubt, I doubt if it will end soon. Studies and articles in various land have been devoted to the criminal episodes and references uh, to them appear also in regional studies on Holocaust ever more frequently. It's impossible to, 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 to list all these works here, so I shall mention only those which have made the most impact. Uh, the most impact. The first, uh, uh, I should start at 2003, 2004, when Jan Grabowski published his first uh, book about uh, in Polish title, Ja tego Żyda znam szantażowanie Żydów w Warszawie. 1939-1943, and after he continues, and years after he continued his research up to his to the last his last uh, published book about the, the role of Polish Blue Police in the Holocaust. At the same time, Barbara Engenkin published her slim but extremely significant work titled Szanowny Panie Gestapo. Donosy to władz niemieckiej w Warszawie i okolicach w latach 1940-1941. The first volume of mentioned yearbook Zagłada Żydów appeared in 2005 and included, among others, the important, a widely quoted article by Alina Skibińska in, uh, and Jakub Petelewicz uh, in English, The Role of Poles in uh, crimes against the Jews in the countryside of the Świętokrzyskie region. How rarely, I think, does a title so clearly and unambiguously, uh, unambiguously in indicate the author's field of interest and become a benchmark for a whole direction of em empirical research. This trend of historical writing had 
has been, as I've mentioned, continued by the author cited above, and uh, in this connection it's, impo it's impossible not to mention the Jan Grabowski, which one? Sorry. Where is my... Ah. Yet not this, 12, one moment. A bit of pardon because I'm, um, ah, oh, I think it's this. Uh, Jan Grabowski book Judemiakt, Polowanie na Żydów, uh, Polowanie na Żydów 1942-45. Uh, in English, Jan Grabowski, Hand for the Jews, Betrayal and Murder in German Occupied Poland. And also to mention Alina Skibińska um, book about Zagłada Domów uh, Trincero. What connects the uh, studies belonging to the perhaps somewhat artificially created category of empirical works is the author's relatively limited interest in the mechanisms for the destruction of Polish Jewry that were planned and implemented by the Nazi. Researchers are also not too interested in the main agent of the extermination of the Polish Jews, the German assessment, the field policeman, the soldier, or the policeman, or the dominant elements in the process of liquidation, the ghettos, the camps, selections, ex execution. They work on the assumption that these are already well-known matters on which scholars have focused their attention for several decades. Instead, they are attracted by empiricism, familiar collection of sources, the ignored testimony of victims and witnesses to Jewish suffering. They do not believe that it was possible not to be aware of the Holocaust, if only because people continually turned away when walking past the wall of the ghetto. They find, find irritating and unspoken post-war consensus to forget about the tragic and same shameful wartime episodes and to bury them in dusty archives. Summing up, Grabowski asks an important question. Could the Nazi have, I quote, carried out uh, the deed of the Holocaust as successfully, as thoroughly, and as precisely as they did, without the help of local collaborators? He is surely aware that we are unable today to provide a reliable answer to this ostensibly simple question. Today we can say that the Poles were complicit in their deaths and there were perhaps about a quarter of a million of them. A critical analysis of narrative sources would catch errors and simply forgeries. Such a route uh, is essential for progress in his research and also, and perhaps above all, peers into the very recent past. However, not all historians are as attracted to this method as Darius Libionka, the co-author of two important volumes, one with Barbara Engelking about Jews in the uh, Warsaw Uprising, another with Lawrence Weiman, entitled in Polish, Bohaterowie Hoszta Pleasure Opisywacze Wokół Żydowskiego Związku Wojskowego. The inevitable consequence of applying these methods is that the deconstructionist element greatly exceeds the, in volume the reconstructionist one. In a word, if Hitler earlier we blunder in a maze of falsehood, uh, such as studies showing that, that various Polish veteran circles invented non-existent aid organization, once that even took an active part in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, then after reading the literature, we realize at most how little we know about events that occurred. From the other side, Barbara Engelking dominates in providing psychoanalytical narrative in our area of interest. Engelking's most recent work uh, is called Jest taki piękny, słoneczny dzień. Losy Żydów szukających ratunku na wsi Polski. She writes in the, the foreword, I quote, helplessness in the face of someone else's 
pain leads to a violent urge to turn away, to withdraw, to flee. But of course, the conviction that we can avoid that which we fear to face is illusory. And although we did not want to, and we still do not want to be witnesses of the Polish Jews' humiliation, torment, and death, we are such witnesses, not by our own choice, but by virtue of our place in birth. Engel King does not ignore the collective fear which overcame the villages and the inhabitants. This was a fear of German reprisal reinforced by sporadic public execution of people who had been found to have been sheltering Jews, the aim of the occupying forces being to sow widespread fear among the population. In her opinion, a frequent motive for murder was avarice of the peasants over Jewish property that they had acquired. She sees murder as a crime of passion, often emerging from a liking of evil. Hatred of Jews was the result of antisemitism that had been passed down from generation to generation. One cannot avoid generali generalization of a very high order when we speak of a truly reprehensible phenomenon, which is well documented and which has unambiguous consequences. But the judgment, I quote Polish peasants, and not for instance many Polish peasants, defines quite differently the phenomenon of local murders of Jews in hiding, making this type of activity the norm and not the fringe, even if a very broad one. In this section, uh, I'd like to also I should mention the two a collective grant uh, monographs uh, published by Center for Research about Provincia Notes and Zaros Krajobraz. It's not enough time. Uh, but <clears throat> the last word is said by scholars from Centrum uh, of Holocaust uh, of Jews in collective book, Dalai's Notes, where they analyze the Jewish tragedy to survive in hideouts, taking to consideration historical material from seven, seven Polish counties. Uh, the thesis strongly confirmed the previous application. And at the end, I'd like to mention that the reception of, uh, in Poland of Timothy Snyder's Bloodlands War between Hitler and Stalin and published in Polish book of Marcin Zaremba, Wilka Trwoga, Polska 1947, have drawn attention uh, to the idea, which is anything but new, that the destruction of the Jews should be studied in, as I call, broader context, that the Poles' attitudes towards it should be discussed alongside an analysis of daily life of, of the so-called Aryan side, as well as alongside a description of German policies of repression and economic exploitation of the Polish population. Snyder is writing about the broader area and about a great many national and social groups affected by terror tactic, while Zaremba is concerned with the extensive spectrum of consequences emanating from the Holocaust. Hitherto, this attempts to draw attention um, to the need to increase the distance to the phenomena studied and to expand the research perspective have not generated a broader discussion. However, not only scholars of the history of Polish Jews are to blame, but simply historians of the Second World War, especially uh, those Polish ones, who are unwilling to cede part of their research territory and uh, undertake interdisciplinary research, without which we shall not learn what part of the social history of Poland under the occupation in reality was linked, linked to the tragic experiences of the Jewish people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear Professor Andrzej Zbikowski, for such detailed and precise uh, analysis of uh, Polish historiography. Uh, and um, actually, if you don't mind, I have one question. Uh, dear Professor, uh, how can you describe uh, the main challenges 
which faces right now Polish historians while trying to work with uh, all those difficult uh, topics which were mentioned in your presentation. Uh, can you come back for uh, a few seconds? Okay. Exactly, you like to know. Is the main train nowadays or...? Uh, probably the main... Uh, the, the most important uh, challenges uh, in uh, um, theoretic or in, uh, in um, other way, for example, working with archives or... I don't think that the archives are the, 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 <clears throat> the very important. We know a lot about a lot of Jews, but I think we have to not to discuss very carefully what uh, could be possible done during the occupation and about the, and especially to take into memory the Jewish tragedy also. Warsaw ghetto uprising, camps, history, and, and etc. To go away the, the, the ignorance and the nationalistic attitude uh, reflecting only the, the Polish uh, rightous among the nation. Of course, we had about 7,000 and we commemorate the rightous all the time, especially by IPN. But you know, we, we should uh, also work on the, the, the negatives all the time. And I think the negatives are very interesting because taught us a bit, a lot about Polish, I think, you know, attitudes, war attitudes about Polish stereotypes, anti-Semitism, and so on, so on. So we have a, a lot to do all the time, and we, I think about 50 historians, younger scholars, are uh, working nowadays on Polish-Jewish relationship or other the attitude of Poles towards the Jewish annihilation. Yeah. Maybe it's the, the, the main... Ačiūlo bai profesoriui už uh, of our section 3 uh, about the uh, historical evolution until uh, 1989. Uh, we are welcoming now Laszlo Karshai. Uh, uh, Professor Emerit from um, the Budapest University. His area of interest is the World War One, World War Two, Bolshevism, Fascism, Holocaust. The professor was, has been for 27 years uh, supervising the Hungarian uh, research group. Uh, Professor Laszlo Kars currently is working on the uh, rather voluminous monography about Holocaust dear in professor, Hungary, dear professor. The floor is yours. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I, I, I have to mute uh, the translator button because I hear the uh, Sorry, I will. So thank you very much for having me and inviting me for this uh, excellent conference. And let me begin with some preliminary, very, very uh, short remark, personal remarks about myself. I was born in a half Jewish, half Catholic family. Uh, my father, was born in an Orthodox Jewish family, and my paternal grandmother uh, was killed in Auschwitz uh, 
at the end of June 1944. The date of her deportation, be careful, was June 14. My maternal grandfather, Antonio Widmar, was a fascist, Italian fascist diplomat based for more than 20 years in Budapest. And uh, 1945, the end of the war in April in the territory of Hungary was evidently liberation for my father, Klein, Alec Klein, later he changed his name for Karsai, in 19, at the end of 1944. And uh, be careful again, he was born in June 14, 1922. And during my early years, at the end of the 1990s, when I was already, already 40 years old, when I discovered why in our family we never celebrated the birthday of my father because uh, he knew, as a historian of the Hungarian Holocaust, that the Jews from the eastern part uh, of Hungary were deported on June 14, especially the, Jew the Jews from Miskolc, Putnok, and other smaller cities on the east, eastern part of Hungary. So we had never a birthday for my father, and I, as a historian, I was uh, already in my early 40s when I discovered the reason, because my father never told me the real reason of the absence uh, of uh, his birthday celebration. 1945 was, uh, in, May, in March 1945, my maternal grandfather, Antonio Widmar, was arrested, and after a week he spent in the infamous Andrási 60, the former headquarter of the Hungarian right-wing organization, Aero Cross organization, Andrási Street 60. And after a week, he was released because he, can, he could prove that uh, after the Badoglio government, during the Badoglio government, at the end of 1943, he became uh, a member of the split uh, embassy in Budapest, Italian embassy, and he saved the life of several persons. Uh, he distributed faked uh, papers and hide uh, other uh, Jews and non-Jews. Non and my father, Alec Korsai, became the first Hungarian Holocaust historian, and after his premature death in 1986, uh, I inherited as research topic the Holocaust. I was also a very small, humble member of the minuscule Hungarian liberal opposition movement. I am, I was, and I am anti-communist, anti-nationalist, anti-anti-Semit, and so on. The next slide, please. Can we go for the next slide? The most important question. According to uh, some experts, the Holocaust uh, during the communist regime were some kind of taboo topic. In case this is not true, what was the main reason, what were the main reasons of the communist Holocaust memory policy, or there were memory policies in plural? To, ex to answer these questions, uh, I have to tell you some words about the history of uh, Hungary in a nutshell. Hungary, as a member of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, was the greatest loser after World War I. We lost two-thirds of our former historical territory, and the regime after the First World War and after the communist-led uh, revolutions of 1990. It was a nationalist, irredentist, anti-Semit, anti-communist, party regime. And uh, between 1938 until 1941, with the help of Hitler and Mussolini, we reconquered some parts of its lost territories. The Piedmont Peace Treaty cut 
to two thirds of the former territories, as you can see. Upper, upper Hungary here, Transylvania and the southern part, uh, the municipal parts, to Aust even to Austria. Our leader was Miklos Horty, and he became, after the middle of the 30s, a reluctant ally of Adolf Hitler. A leaflet, very popular in 1919 Hungary, Jury and Soviet Death of Hungary. From 1938, we reconquered with the help of Hitler Mussolini one part of Upper Hungary, one part of Transylvania, and the smaller parts of the south of uh, Hungary. The Holocaust in Hungary. In the spring and summer of 1944, during 89 days, more than 437 persons were deported. deported. This was a Euro record of Adolf Eichmann with the help, with the enthusiastic collaboration of the Horty and the Mestoyai, Prime Minister the Mestoyai government. Altogether with the Aerocross regime, after, after October 1944, we had uh, around more than half a million Jewish victims. This was the fastest, biggest uh, deportation action at the end of the war. The new regime imposed by the Red Army after the liberation of the country, liberation, it was mainly for the Jews, the remaining Jews, but it was an occupation of Hungary. The Red Army started at bloodbath. This is a myth, a Jewish revenge. The state security department led by Jews and the so-called people's courts, a verbatim translation of the German counterpart of this, led by the Nazis, the Jewish forced laborers, the former Jewish forced laborers, the survivors of the Holocaust, or Jews returned, Jewish communists returned from Moscow, and they arrested, tortured, and killed several ten thousands of Hungarians. The counter myth, people, and I know personally, my, I have several friends who claim that after the Second World War, almost everybody escaped prosecution with the exception of few major war criminals, some Aerocross mass murderers, but the overwhelming majority of the Hungarian war criminals escaped retribution. Istvan Ries, social democrat, he was a Jew, a lawyer and minister of justice from 1945 until his arrestation and he was tortured to the death by the communists. He claimed in April 1945, the war criminals cannot expect justice, but retribution. The men of the extreme regime committed awful crimes and even a part of the people was contaminated. The punishment of the perpetrators is a tool of the cure. The one part, of the people was contaminated and the punishment, the, the work of the people's court, courts is a tool of the cure. The bloodbath, bloodbath. I cannot say that it was a bloodbath. Only, only less than 500 people were sentenced to death. And again, only under parenthesis, 189 people were legally executed until 1948. Approximately, out of a population of 10 million, approximately 40,000 people were interned. We had 26 and 26,097 prison sentences, and almost the half were acquitted. Deported some 200,000 Volksdeutschen, Swabs, Germans, in, living in Hungary for centuries. The luckiest one who were deported 
relocated as yesterday, one of the young and excellent translator uh, translated uh, Adam Michnik's word, uh, relocated. They were deported, they were expulsed from the territory of Hungary to West, the future West Germany, and 20,000 to East Germany and the mast power and the rest, some 35,000 Germans were deported by the Red Army into the Soviet Union. Another 62,000 people, Hungarians, who remained in Hungary, were punished by being fired from their jobs, lost their pension, and so on. In comparison with in European context, we cannot claim that the Hungarian retribution was something especially cruel. In Holland, you can see some 155 persons were sentenced to death. In Belgium, uh, again, only 242 executed. In France, uh, five times more populated than as Hungary, uh, they had 791 executed. A real bloodbath was in, uh, in Bulgaria with 2,200 persons executed. In Italy and France, uh, we had partisan trials, mass executions, lynchings. Uh, this was a civil war, uh, around 10,000 and 10,000 uh, victims. The Hungarian people's courts were not tools in the hands of the communists. But uh, this is a real fact, this is a fact, a historical fact, that many, many Jews participated in the work of the Hungarian People's Court as police officers, detectives, prosecutors, people's judge. And we cannot claim that it, they were objective, they were neutral, they were professional uh, prosecutors or uh, people's judge uh, or police officers. My late friend and mentor, Randolph Brehem, his original name was uh, Abraham, Adolf Abraham, but uh, after the Second World War, after losing more than 22 of his closest relatives, parents, uh, and other relatives. He changed his name when he went uh, into the United States. Randolph Brehem collected a huge selected bi bi bibliography of the Hungarian Holocaust. This is uh, almost 700 pages long, and uh, in it we have more than 5,500 items, books, articles, uh, studies, uh, etc. This is in Hungarian, in Hebrew, in German, French, English. Uh, this is a huge work. And uh, in the foreword of uh, Randy Braham, he claimed that hung in Hungary, the Holocaust as a topic was forced uh, from 1948 to 1953 into the Orwellian black hole of the history. I do not like to argue with uh, my esteemed uh, mentor and uh, friend and colleague, but I do not think so that he was right. First of all, uh, let's start with the imminent post-war period. After the liberation of Hungary, uh, until 1948, in Hungary was published uh, more than 200 books, several translated into English, Janu Levoi book uh, about uh, Raul uh, Wallenberg or Mik Miklos Nisli's memoirs. He was a doctor in Auschwitz and uh, worked under the supervision of Mengele, was translated already in 1947. Uh, into English and quoted extensively, for example, by uh, Raoul Hilberg and others. And uh, how can we explain these uh, 200 books? Because uh, one of the reasons was that Hungary was liberated and occupied by the Red Army, but until 1948, uh, we lived under a relative uh, democracy. 
the communist regime was imposed only in 1948. Until 1948, we, uh, we lived under democracy. We had uh, liber liberated press, uh, and we have several uh, books, uh, printing houses, and so on. And we had a large audience. Uh, several uh, hundred thousands of Jews uh, wanted to know what and why did happen with them. And the history black hole uh, lasted not uh, until 1953, but lasted uh, until 54, as you can see in the, on the next picture. And we have not one communist regime in Hungary, but at least two. Uh, one uh, was led by Matyas Rakosi. He was born also as a Jew and led a brutal Stalinist dictatorship. But after crushing the 56th revolution, Janos Kadar was the prime uh, first secretary of the Hungarian Socialist Party. And Hungary became the happiest barrack of the socialist camp, or uh, more precisely, the socialist lager. And after 63, Janos Kadar openly declared, for whoever is not against us is for us. You can you remember the famous saying of Jesus Christ. Here you can see this history black hole. Until 1948, we published more than 200 books. And then one year above the Holocaust, smaller and larger book, memories, poems, literary works, uh, and scientific works, only a handful. But during the Kada regime, we have a very strange uh, culture, cultural policy. This very strange cultural policy was named as the policy of the three T's. In Hungarian, tilt, it means prohibited, taboo topics. We have three taboo topics. First of all, the Soviet-Hungarian relationship. We were liberated, but a large number, several 10,000 or even 100,000 uh, Soviet soldiers remained in Hungarian soil. The most important taboo topic was the revolution, the history, the real history of the 1956 revolution. And the third one is the situation of the Hungarian minority or minorities in the neighboring countries. The second, uh, the second topic was under the two, tür. It, in Hungarian tür, in English tolerated. For example, the leaders of the cultural policy tolerated if someone wants to speak about the mistakes committed during building the socialism, it was tolerated the historical research uh, about the Horthy regime. And uh, we have we were not compelled to say that uh, the Horthy regime was a fascist or Nazi uh, regime. And the third category was the Tamogot, the supported category. Ev evidently, the pro-Soviet, pro-Marxist, pro-Leninist uh, topics. The Holocaust uh, was somewhere between the second and the third topics. We can claim, uh, we can say that uh, this uh, cultural policy was something flexible, organized and under a flexible red lines. You see, when you see on the street a red line, you have to stop. But in the cultural policy, when you see a red line or a, a green line, you were not sure that you can cross or not. You can cross uh, sometimes even the red line a little bit. Uh, almost sure you can uh, go through a yellow line, and evidently the green line is always uh, beca sometimes became, as in the real uh, life, uh, red or uh, even 
yellow line. The Pantral Evolution. Officially, uh, after 56, uh, the, the regime, the propagandist of the regime claimed that the 56 revolution le was led by former Arrow Cross members, hearty followers, gendarmes, and their purpose was the restoration of the capitalist order. And they were paid and instigated by the Radio Free Europe and the CIA. The retribution, the bloodbath, uh, again, more than 200 people executed, 28,000 imprisoned, interred for long years. But after uh, 1963, this was a total, almost total amnesty. And until the collapse of the communism, we had no political prisoners. The main target of the secret police was the Catholic Church. The Jewish congregation, led by silent and docile rabbis, was silent as an organization. The Holocaust was a tolerated uh, topic, as I mentioned, admitting the, the responsibility of the Hungarian authorities from Horthy to the last gendarmes. This was a useful political tool to condemn the capitalist, nationalist, anti-Semite regime. As I mentioned, 19, the revolution 1956 uh, was an anti-Semite counter-revolution. And uh, you can see that the tolerated, as a tolerated topic, uh, we had uh, until 64 uh, and 66, uh, we have more than 133 books. Among them, uh, my father, uh, Alek Karsai, published uh, five huge documentary books uh, about the 1944 persecution and deportation of the Jews from the countryside, and two huge uh, books uh, about the so-called Hungarian forced labor uh, service with, for the men. And it was a very uh, popular topic, not only tolerated, but popular uh, topic. Um, Imre Kertész, the Nobel laureate, Imre Kertész was among uh, the people who were not a bestseller author. Imre Kertész was not uh, well known among the ordinary people, but Maria Embers or George Saro's books uh, were published in hundreds thousands copies and reproduced and reprint uh, in several uh, editions and tolerated or even supported topic uh, the Hungarian uh, Holocaust. Uh, and uh, during the last uh, 10 years of the communist regime, and we can claim that it became from the tolerated topic a supported, a very lucrative uh, topic of the Hungarian uh, Holocaust. Not only, we can speak not only about the books, but we can speak about the uh, movie, the, the, the films. Uh, we had uh, more than 20, more than 20 uh, huge, very successful uh, movies, uh, partly or five out of these 21 films uh, consecrated to the uh, Holocaust. And this uh, movies was uh, several times uh, rebroadcasted uh, movies in the TVs. Uh, and uh, the Holocaust as a historical topic was neutral, even I can say boring for a historian, politically not too correct, but tolerated. And I, I can choose in 1933, uh, 19, sorry, uh, 1983, I, cho I have chosen uh, as a boring, neutral, politically uh, correct, not too correct topic, the Hungarian gypsy uh, holocaust. And I was not uh, under, the, uh, I, it was not a dangerous uh, topic uh, with my political uh, views. Uh, I can work uh, almost totally free in the uh, archives. Uh, a few words about the textbooks. Uh, we had uh, some really Stalinist uh, or Rakoshist textbooks uh, during the Rakoshi regime. Uh, and until the end uh, of the Kada regime, uh, we have uh, three uh, different uh, editions of the high school uh, high school tech, uh, history uh, textbooks. For example, Andre Bullock's very boring uh, history textbooks for the high schools uh, had 14 editions. 
uh, evidently uh, almost practically no mention of the European Jewish Holocaust and no mention uh, about the Hungarian, uh, practically a Hungarian Holocaust. Uh, and uh, this is a rank uh, of the uh, victims of the Nazi camps. Uh, for example, the first place uh, the Nazi regime wanted and destroyed the political prisoners, evidently the communists uh, and the social democrats, the members of the resistance movements. In the third place, uh, uh, they put the Soviet uh, POWs, uh, and the fourth place, the common criminals, and uh, we Jews uh, and the gypsies uh, were mentioned in the last uh, place. Um, and I have to argue a little bit uh, with those uh, lecturers who claim that the gypsies were condemned to death by the Nazi regime. This is not true in the Hungarian case, not true in the Romanian case, and it is not true with the Einsatzgruppen on the occupied Soviet territories, but I do not uh, want to argue about the gypsy uh, persecution of the gypsies. This is a too sensitive topic uh, even today in, in Hungary. It was uh, almost impossible to research or publish about the real situation of the Hungarian gypsies, but I was uh, free, uh, almost free, I could research uh, freely in the archives uh, of the, about the, Hung the persecution of the Hungarian Roma. The, the Holocaust was a tolerated, if you wanted to speak about the anti-Semitism of the ordinary, uh, ordinary Hungarians, about the pogroms after 1945. We have uh, a handful of uh, pogroms, not a Kielce pogrom, but uh, uh, we had some half a dozen victims. What about the participation of the ordinary Hungarians in the spoliation of the Jews in 44 and 45? Uh, the Holocaust was a natural, organic, well-deserved place in the public mind uh, after the Second World War, uh, and uh, the majority of the historian claimed that the Hungarian people is and always was innocent. Only the Horthy regime was responsible, and Hungarian with German blood. Uh, it was a short period in for, for 48 to 55, 54, do not speak, do not publish, do not read about this topic, and uh, tolerated and even supported uh, during the Gadar regime. Uh, <clears throat> and I would like to terminate my uh, lecture with uh, a Beatles song. Uh, you may be the elder one uh, among you remember the uh, he, the famous Beatles song, you say yes, uh, I say no, you say hello, I say goodbye. In Hungary, this is the competitive martyrdom. You say Holocaust, I say Trianon. Uh, you say Horty was a war criminal, uh, I say uh, he was not a collaborator of uh, Hitler, or uh, I say he reconquered a uh, place, uh, he conquered some uh, large territories uh, lost uh, during the, after the Trianon Peace Treaty. So it is impossible, the gap is very uh, large to discuss uh, with who say uh, Trianon uh, and those who say uh, Holocaust. Thank you for your attention. Dear Professor Laszlo Karse, thank you very much for your precise and extremely interesting uh, uh, paper, which, yes, of course, which gave uh, us uh, an opportunity to understand not only processes which uh, lasted in uh, Hungarian historiography, but also in uh, so-called historical culture. And that is why I strongly believe that uh, the audience have uh, comments or questions. And uh, dear colleagues, please join our virtual discussion. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I, I, I just wonder if you could very briefly describe the evolution of the uh, research uh, regarding the Holocaust and the commemoration of the Holocaust in Hungary after the collapse of the communism. And perhaps also 
uh, the, the attitude of uh, Viktor Orban's government toward uh, the Holocaust research and the Holocaust commemoration. It would be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for this, uh, for this question. Uh, I understood from the title of this uh, panel that uh, I had to stop uh, uh, somewhere in 1989. But uh, I, am, I am not a humble historian. I am very proud that uh, I was invited uh, already from Seattle to New York, uh, to Berlin and Paris and, uh, and uh, Jerusalem also, uh, because uh, we have uh, a lot of anti-Semit in Hungary. And uh, during the last uh, already 11 years, we have uh, uh, the so-called Orban government. Uh, and um, uh, for example, uh, our uh, not so beloved leader Orban uh, claimed that Horty was an exceptional statesman. statesman. So uh, I spoke spoke, I was invited because the Hungarian and new anti-Semites, uh, uh, because of the rehabilitation of the Horthy regime and because the whitewashing uh, of the history uh, of the Hungarian, of the Hungary, and especially uh, those who claimed that the Hungarians were uh, innocent victims uh, of the Germans. Uh, if you uh, have uh, enough time and money to come to Hungary, uh, in the middle of uh, Budapest, um, we have the so-called Freedom Square, Sobocsag uh, Tér, Freedom Square, uh, where we have uh, already more than f 15 years a Horthy statue, and we have a statue of the occupation uh, of the victims of the occupation uh, of the Nazi of the Nazi occupation in 1944. It represents uh, an evil uh, Nazi eagle and uh, attacking this Nazi eagle from above. Uh, the innocent Hungary represented as Gabriel Archangel and uh, we Hungarians, uh, this is declared uh, already in the new constitution, in the preamble of the new Hungarian constitution uh, written by Josef Sayer. Uh, sorry for mention this uh, fact. Uh, uh, Josef Sayer uh, is was uh, one of the leaders of the Hungarian uh, parliamentary members in Brussels. But maybe you remember that a few months ago he was arrested uh, for taking part uh, at a party uh, organized uh, exclusively for uh, men. Uh, I was enough uh, politically correct, not to mention why only men, younger and elder men. So, uh, Josef Sayer wrote our new constitution uh, during a short trip from Strasbourg to Brussels. And in the preamble uh, of, uh, of this constitution, it claimed that Hungary lost its independence in uh, 1944. And from, from 1944 uh, until 1990, uh, we lost uh, as a not an independent country. It claims that Hungarians, Hungary and the Hungarians were innocent victims under foreign occupation. We do not speak about the role of Horthy. We do not speak about, uh, for example, a very interesting fact of, of the Hungarian Holocaust, that Horthy nominated the Domestoyai government in March, after, three days after the occupation of Hungary, and Horthy, the same Horthy, on July 6, stopped the further deportation. Again, a personal remark, my father was hiding in Budapest, and all the Buda, almost all the Budapest Jews who were not uh, killed, massacred by the Arrow Cross regime after October, remained in Budapest because Horthy stopped the deportation in July 6, 1944. So Horthy not only a great exceptional statesman, but the savior of the Budapest Jews. 
Yes, I can accept. But Horthy, at the same time, is a collaborator of Hitler, who led the deportation of uh, 437,000 Jews from the countryside. So I am very uh, pleased to tell you that my father uh, survived the Holocaust because of Horthy, and I am very sad to admit that my grandmother was killed six years before my birth in Auschwitz. So Horthy was one of the greatest uh, killer collaborator of the Nazis, but the Hungarian government actually want to speak only about the Hungarian rituals and about Hungary as an innocent victim of the German occupation. And the, after the 45, uh, we had no uh, communist collaborators. Uh, those who are uh, among, uh, among you uh, can uh, speak fluently in French, uh, can understand me when I uh, quote uh, one of my best friends, a French uh, historian, who some 20 years ago explained to me that in French, you cannot use the word collaborator, communist collaborator. You can use only for the Nazis. But in Hungary, we had a lot of communist collaborators. Uh, in the year of the collapse of the communists, out of the population of 10 million, we had more than 800,000 party members. Not all the party members were, uh, were communist collaborators, but uh, the majority uh, of the party members uh, were pro, were not against the regime. So they were with the, with the regime. So the situation in Hungary, a little bit better than in Poland. Uh, last time, three, uh, exactly, almost exactly three years ago, I gave a lecture uh, in, uh, in New York. Those who want to get a copy of my lecture, I, I was asked to speak about the, uh, the situation of the Holocaust research in Poland uh, and uh, in, uh, in Hungary. Uh, and I, I can uh, tell you that in Hungary, we have no uh, Holocaust law. So in Poland, uh, everybody can get uh, three years prison if we speak about the collaboration of the ordinary Poles uh, with the uh, Germans. Um, the, the role uh, of the ordinary Poles uh, in, Hun in, the, uh, in the killing and robbing and raping uh, the, the Jews, the hiding Jews. In Hungary, uh, we can speak, we can publish. Uh, we do not get uh, large uh, sums from the, from the state, this is quite naturally. Uh, but uh, in Budapest, uh, to tell only one name, Maria Schmidt, uh, the favorite historian uh, of the of Orban, uh, Prime Minister Orban, got a huge uh, museum. Uh, in the middle, in the downtown of Budapest, uh, the Terror House uh, Museum. Uh, you can visit this Terror House Museum since 2002nd. Uh, more all, already more than 20 years in this museum on the permanent. There are uh, uh, not only permanent exhibition, but on the permanent exhibition, we, you have uh, 22 rooms, larger or smaller rooms. Out of these 22 rooms, three consecrated uh, to the Hungarian Holocaust. Um, and uh, the other uh, 19 is uh, for the terror of the Rakoshi and Kadar uh, regime. Uh, and to be clear, uh, during the Rakoshi and Kadar regime, since 1948 uh, uh, till the collapse of communism, we have uh, 3,000 uh, perished, killed pe uh, people. 3,000. Killed uh, in prisons, killed uh, in uh, the massacres uh, during and after uh, the 56 revolution. Uh, and uh, the 3,000 people, be careful, 3,000 people, one train, we have uh, 157 deportation trains uh, who started from Hungary uh, to Auschwitz uh, from May uh, 1944. 
and in every single train uh, transported more than 2,500 Jews or 3,500 Jews. Uh, and uh, every day, uh, and uh, Rudolf Hess was uh, exhausted and very tired, every day uh, around 8,000 or 12,000 Hungarian Jews arrived to Auschwitz. Auschwitz is the biggest Hungarian cemetery. And uh, I, I really, I am an anti-communist, uh, believe me. I was, uh, the secret police also know. But uh, to speak about these uh, 3,000 victims, uh, death victims uh, of the Hungarian communist regime, and do not speak about the 500,000 Hungarian Jewish victims, only celebrate these uh, 800 people who saved uh, the Hungarian Jews this is uh, a great discrepancy. So uh, everybody who wants to know uh, much more about the Hungarian uh, nationalist uh, anti-Semitic uh, Holocaust policy, uh, I can send uh, at least uh, six or seven uh, of my studies published during the last 30 years. I do not like to to write and speak about them, but I but when I am uh, invited to New York to speak about the Hungarian and Polish nationalist uh, and anti-Semit, uh, I go. Dear participants of the conference, do you have more questions or comments related with uh, Professor uh, Laszlo Karsze presentation? No? Uh, dear Professor, thank you very much uh, for being with us, for sharing your uh, knowledge with us. Ir aš dabar noriu pakviesti ketvirtąjį sekcijos evolucionuojantį istoriją iki 1989-ųjų karas ir holokaustas tarp atminties ir užmarštės pranešėja. Tai Dr. Zygmas Vitkus, Speaker in this session is Dr. Zygmas Vitkus, historian and uh, publisher. Uh, he defended his doctoral thesis with the topic a memorial uh, in the policy of remembrance and uh, the Ponar case, 1944-2016. And the Dr. Zygmas Vitkus is deeply interested in the remembrance of the Second World War, remembrance policy of the Holocaust and the culture of the memorials. So please, uh, Dr. Zygmas Vitkus, the floor is yours. Good day to everybody. I'm very happy to be able to see and to, to be given this opportunity to share my insights about uh, the Holocaust, remembrance or oblivion processes during the Soviet times and during the uh, national rebirth movement. And I will try to uh, look at these processes uh, from the uh, perspectives of uh, uh, the Soviet rule, the Jewish community, and the Lithuanian society. The consequences of the Nazi occupation in Lithuania are well known. Well, speaking roughly, in, purely in the language of figures, we're talking about 205,000 Jews from Lithuania and abroad, and at least 170,000 of casualties of Red Army soldiers and uh, other victims. So during this period, uh, uh, what some researchers call the landscape of violence has emerged in Lithuania. So what do usually the individuals do who have experienced such catastrophes? Well, at least six things. They appreciate what has been destroyed, what has been left, they bury the dead, search for surviving compatriots, try to collect cultural values, build monuments, and work to restore basic community institutions. And this is exactly what has been done by the Jewish survivors from Lithuania. I would like to point a number of uh, the most remarkable uh, uh, and examples of activities by the Jews, and I would like to single out these. These would be the sermons in the Ponar synagogue and the Jewish museum establishment, the schools and the orphanage. 
And the uh, burial of the Torah in 1944, as well as the erection of the memorial in Ponar in 1948. Well, the fact that all these activities were licensed by the Soviet authorities show that at least uh, the Soviet authorities showed some flexibility in these activities by the Jewish, but they were soon to be criticized by Moscow. Lithuanian communists were accused by their Moscow friends for inappropriate approach to the Jewish question. In 1944, uh, the State Jewish Museum was established and it immediately started organizing an exposition titled Fascism is Death, the extermination of the Jews of the Soviet Lithuanian population during the German fascist occupation and the Jews in the resistance movement. This display was the first attempt to thematize the massacre of Jews in Lithuania in the museum space. The aim of the exposition was formulated by its organized to combine the universalist, the humanistic and particularistic or the Jewish approaches. Well, the display emphasizes the destruction of the Jewish nation is to be treated as an example of Nazi crimes. Unfortunately, this uh, exhibit, uh, this display was not allowed to be launched and in the summer of 2006, the Jewish Museum was closed down. The very same sad fate also befell on the Jewish memorial in Ponar. Uh, it was uh, not officially unveiled, and a couple of years later, we, it is believed that in 1952 it was uh, dismembered and there was uh, an official bill, uh, a Soviet monument built. And uh, the builders of the first monument were accused of nationalism, claiming their uniqueness. Well, examining the articles which appeared in the Lithuanian press during the Stalinist period, uh, well, what strikes as an eye-catching, it is not the denial of the massacre of the Jews, but rather the marginalization of uh, uh, such massacres. The non-uniqueness of the massacre of Jews is overemphasized. Yes, Jews were killed, but they were not the only ones. Three strategies developed at the summit of the USSR during the war were used to, uh, for such marginalization of victims, and they were extremely extensively discussed in detail by Mario Kucha. And these are uh, the strategy of universalization of Jewish victims, the people, the residents and citizens, and nationalization whenever we are talking about, and as well as internationalization when we talk about citizens of various uh, uh, nationalities. These strategies allow it uh, to assimilate and to uh, fuse the history of the massacre of Jews into a common Soviet narrative of history in which all the residents of the USSR and Soviet activists in the first place were considered to have suffered from the Nazi terror. Lithuanian society is, uh, didn't remember the Holocaust as, as the Stalinists, so we can only consider it. The fact that the massacres were remembered is questionable. But this memory, it is important very much to emphasize, is overshadowed by the new experiences, repressions, deportations and the terror of the Stalinist regime. So we might say that there were no preconditions for Lithuanians as a society to reflect on the experience of the Holocaust. The desire of the Soviets uh, power to create an image that the victims of the Nazi regime were all Lithuanians allowed some Lithuanians to dispel unpleasant memories of the Holocaust in w if there was such an intention. And it might have been, uh, history might have been different if the Soviets had left Lithuania in 1950 way, just as it happened in Austria. The five-year period after Stalin's death was a period of struggle for power uh, by the new head of the USSR Nikita Khrushchev. The old new political elite of this country condemned the cult of Stalin's personality and the reforms of political, administrative and economic sectors began in the country. Soviet Lithuania at that time, after a drastic collectivization, experienced a very deep agricultural crisis, in particular considering that 85% at that time were uh, rural populations, so basically that was the crisis of the entire nation. So not surprisingly, in such circumstances, the government and focused on the current issues, especially the economy, whereas the culture and even the use of history for political purposes was, was uh, 
um, little taken care of. Fraternal graves were abandoned, there were no new monuments, Iponar, and uh, there were no new museums or monuments built, with an only exception were the graves for the Red Army soldiers, which were uh, put in order. The attitude of the government to the heritage of Lithuanian Jewish history at that time is best described by three examples, two from Kaunas, one from Vilnius. During uh, uh, 500 tombstones were overthrown and uh, tried to be taken out in Kaunas, Zaliakalnes, uh, Jewish cemeteries, whereas the Panamonia cemetery was used as a gravel quarry, whereas the bones that appeared from the ground were sold as fertilizer. And, uh, in the Jew and in the pits, uh, in the grave pits, uh, uh, people were grazing their cattle. Uh, the government responded to the alerts of the Jewish community about uh, the condition of the graves, but it was a policy, a policy of uh, uh, putting out the fires and not as a systematic caring of these places. Uh, after removing uh, and the, rem uh, the remembrance of the Holocaust was mainly in the private surroundings, so the private remembrance among the Jewish families, as well as uh, in hope of forgetting about this terrible uh, period. After removing the figure of Franz Stalin uh, from uh, political space, the, re the re uh, reborn regime uh, began to look for a new basis for its identity and the ways to consolidate society. And during this period, the first generation of the post-war children grew up, for whom it was already possible to try to tell a genuine story about the war. The underlying myth of the USSR during this period became the Great Patriotic War, which highlighted the plots of the general Soviet people's struggle led by the heroism. And one of the depictions of this war was the plot of the massacre of the Soviet people. To commemorate him, museums, memorials and monuments were established during the USSR. In 1958, Kona's 9th Fort Museum was opened, Pirchipe Museum and Monument in 1960, and the Ponar Museum in 1960. Our neighbors, uh, Latvians, they also established a number of uh, uh, memorials. Uh, you, you see pictures from Salas Pils and from the Belarus Katina Memorial Ensemble and the Pirchipe Memorial. If we had visited the museums of Kona's uh, Ninth Fort or Ponar, you might get an impression that uh, the object of Nazi repressions and terror was Lithuanian residents, Vilnius residents, Kaunas residents, men, women, communists, as well as other, one, other loyal uh, followers of the Soviet government. Uh, one, uh, any reference had to be made about the Jews, uh, uh, there was only a reference to ghetto, not about concrete uh, uh, people. Uh, such renaming of the victims allowed the government to achieve two goals. It helped uh, uh, to create the impression that the Nazi target was the entire Soviet society, as well as created the illusion that this society was closer to the Soviet ideal of a stateless society. It is necessary to note that during the Khrushchev name, uh, there were many, uh, after losing a couple of those ideological strings, more opportunities were opened up for the narrative uh, about Soviet citizens as well as the massacre of Jews. We can mention here the novels of Ivshok, the mayor, the memoirs of Masha Rolnikaiti, a collection of articles by Sofia Binkiena, and a book about the Kona's ghetto, even the, about the Ponar Museum. And this topic is quite a repetitive, uh, such as Judita uh, Vichunite or Vidultas Bloje papers. I would uh, look at it. Uh, uh, 
In order for the fictional books and uh, for these images to stick in the memory, we had to uh, certain political and social uh, frame of mind was needed in order to support this version. And the Soviet authorities didn't support. It is noteworthy that during the Khrushchev era, uh, there was this brutal uh, destruction of Jewish historical and cultural heritage that was taking place. Not because it was Jewish historical and cultural heritage, because that included uh, uh, Christian and Lutheran cemeteries being destroyed, but because there was no benefit seen. Uh, all the actions were made from a pragmatic point of view. There were some sites uh, for the construction of the further buildings that had to be vacated. And this was the fate which happened to the largest Jewish cemetery in Lithuania in Uzhupis. In September 1962, uh, there was a demonstration trial of perpetrators of the massacre of Soviet citizens, which took place in Vilnius. It tried members of the Lithuanian police formations, which cooperated with the Nazis. So nobody talked about Jews in these cause, except that uh, the accused non-commissioned officer, uh, Kranas Matukas. And this was recorded in the memoirs by one of the Holocaust survivors, Stanislavas Rubinovas, the beginning of the quote. Every time when the participants of the process mentioned Soviet citizens, Pranas Matukas would specify the nationality. Those of your Soviet citizens are the simplest Jews. So, and again, uh, those of your Soviet citizens are the simplest uh, Jews. So how is that? The judges, prosecutors, journalists, witnesses, were they all lying? And the beast Matukas was telling the truth? This is indeed a terrible paradox. Rubinov himself also had to sing uh, the ballad uh, the fourth of the ninth by composer in the Zhigaitis, in which the following lines are repeated. I lift a gray uh, uh, glump of, of uh, earth like a burning bonfire, and when the walls are shot, they shout, Marseille, Angie, Mary. What associations would have arisen if the names of uh, Jehuda, Ishok, and Judith had been added to Marseille, Andrew, and Mary? We can only wonder. I believe we may have seen the film by Raimundas Vabalas about the ninth fort in 1962, and if I'm not mistaken, only the Jew is uh, pictured here. So this is how we uh, move to Brezhnev uh, era, and the Brezhnev era is considered to be the, uh, the climax of the great patriotic war myth and its expression. During this period, the sacralization of the great patriotic war took place, and the demonstrative cult of the war veterans and the army in general prevailed. The ideology of victory became especially important during this period. As part of the myth of the myth, the plot of the massacres of Soviet people was also functioning, although it was not emphasized and it had nothing to do with the victory. Rather, this plot functioned as an example to demonstrate what might have happened had it not been for the Red Army's liberation mission. So the heroes of this period are war heroes and political prisoners. And uh, you know, the film by Almandas Grykevichus Ave Vita, you see that the background chosen by the director it seems like honor. Uh, and there are 100,000 of uh, uh, victims, uh, uh, show, uh, or the symbol of 100 of victims is shown, but mainly this film is about um, political prisoners. Uh, as it was in the Khrushchev era, the theme of the Holocaust uh, also spread to the public in the field of art. For example, in Bronis Rajavich's Roads of the Dawn, or Jonas Avijus' Homestead is Empty, but here again, the influence might have been uh, limited one because the slogans and ideologies uh, had to be uh, used uh, in the government-controlled communication. So what do the representatives of the Lithuanian society of that time know about the Second World War? He knows, if he wants to know, about the brutality of the Hitler regime, they know about Pirchupi, they know about Kona's Ninth Fourth as a place of massacres of all nations, at least all the Lithuanians may, might have visited visited these sites at least once in their life. Not, a, uh, not many know about Ponar, and these are mainly the Lithuanian Vilnius school children who are taking on school excursions. 
And therefore, this is silent uh, remembrance of uh, Jews is usually persist in the communities of small Lithuanian towns, which all have their own secrets. And many members of these communities have seen the massacres, and those communities are home to people who are popularly called as Jewish uh, killers. One of the secrets of such silent villages and towns is recorded in the uh, memoirs written by uh, exile Dalia Grinkevichute. She was uh, pushed by the Soviet uh, power to leave the town. And uh, those who were killing Jews was known for everybody. I'm going uh, to uh, leave uh, the, uh, the area when the Mina Kaganaitis and mother murderers are going to uh, leave the district. And in her memoirs, uh, she's also uh, mentioning about a uh, ballad uh, written about uh, these two uh, killed Jews. Looking at the summary of the Soviet period in Lithuania, it is obvious that the Jewish aspect of the Nazi victims was not important for the policy makers and executors. At best, the Jewish victims are represented as the first victims. In Soviet politics of remembrance, the tendency of pure universalization of victims prevailed and in which there was no particular uh, place for the Jewish suffering, not necessarily because of anti-Semitism, but because of the visual logic of the past which was created by the Soviet regime. The reluctance to single out the suffering of individual nations is not to be explained as a virtue, but as an aim to present a simplified and unquestionable image of history for the Soviet people. The conditions for experiencing the memory of the Holocaust in the private memories of families uh, to be explored in the space of public communication were only uh, possible in, in 40 years when the Soviets uh, introduced its uh, Glasnost movement. During this period, the community of Holocaust survivors finally appeared in public. Their portraits were captured in the unique photography cycle by Antanas Sutkus Pro Memoria. Looking at these photographs, you can feel that they contain our people and our story. We have to bear in mind that at that time, the Holocaust survivors, there are still quite a few of them, those who were born in 1923, in the beginning of the Holocaust, uh, that uh, they were uh, 65 uh, years of age. In general, in 1988-89, the period in Lithuania as in other Central and Eastern European countries was a time of speaking uh, out on various topics of the Soviet era of silence just as uh, was nicely put by the um, Cordelia, the daughter of uh, King Lee, time breaks the cloak of deceit. So if the scheme of the return of the Holocaust to this period were to be presented, it would be as follows. The Soviet government loosens up its uh, uh, strings to political and ideological control, and the social groups, communities of remembrance begin to talk about the past. And this creates preconditions for the Lithuanian society to learn about the Holocaust. Probably the first unauthorized campaign in the still Lithuanian, Lithuanian took place in 1988 in Ponar, before the official start of the 9th of May celebrations. Uh, the Jewish activists in Vilnius and Polnar placed the Stars of David by the massacre pits. All of them were quickly removed, but some of them still managed to see them. On that day, uh, something else has happened. Uh, during the official commemoration, a representative of the government spoke about the fact that in Polnar, the majority of the victims were Jews. And on the 9th of June of the same year, there was this uh, well um, remarkable uh, rally by Sayudis in which many of the Jews participated. And that was probably the first event in Lithuania where it was, uh, first of all, uh, quite outspoken about the Holocaust. A Jewish activists organized a march uh, of the living uh, to corner with the uh, slogan, the Jewish nation is alive. I mentioned that the Scientist leadership supported the idea of Jewish national uh, revival. In essence, uh, uh, part of the uh, Jewish intelligentsia were well aware of uh, the Holocaust, and it is also obvious that the Saudi's leadership were well aware of the intention paid by the Jewish genocide.
not only because of uh, the injustice to history. And uh, there were some uh, major uh, topics that evolved and that were being analyzed by the historians, namely the Jewish and Lithuanian relations before and during the war, Lithuanian cooperation or collaboration with the Nazis, Jewish rescue, and so on. In both documents, and these are statements by the Lithuanian intelligentsia, or intellectuals, first of all, on the relationship of Lithuanians and uh, Jews, and the statement by the Sayudis uh, in the reconstituent Sayudis, uh, it is named that the Jews are a historical nation and the friendly cooperation or cohabitation of these nations is a necessary uh, thing, and there is no justification uh, for uh, the Holocaust. And unfortunately, some Lithuanians were also, some of them were also involved, and the dominating narrative uh, also in the exile. Uh, that these were the generates uh, who participated in, in the killings of the Jews. So we have to single out one uh, sentence from intelligentsia. We were not being given the chance of uh, to, uh, to put into words our pain. So it is noted that the Lithuanians were not given the opportunity to repent after the war. And uh, uh, the transformational uh, Sayudis of uh, Lithuania was a sort, some sort of apologetic uh, Document. It reflected the version of the history which was supported by the Lithuanian diaspora that both nations have suffered, the Lithuanian nation uh, suffered first, and among them, of course, there were some Jews who were also collaborators with the Soviet government. If one sentence were to be distinguished from the latter, I would have to say, do not blame the innocent when uh, blaming the, uh, innocent, the guilty. I would venture to say that at the institutional level on the 23rd of September, 1990, the Holocaust was recognized as the Day of Remembrance in Lithuania, but it was very well uh, talked about in public. The fact that the reception of the Holocaust in Lithuanian society is not going to be an easy task it became clear slightly later, in the first years of independence. And the reasons for this uh, uh, difficult or uh, quite a controversial topic should be uh, seen in the history of the Holocaust, but also in the later period. Since the memory of the Holocaust was marginalized or silenced in Soviet-controlled Lithuania, and simply it was not uh, clear how to approach this topic, and uh, the, that could be some insinuations by uh, some of the foreign authors which uh, uh, allowed uh, some of the Lithuanians to become the apologetic. Uh, so, in general, the state, historians and society in 1990s opened up a vast and uh, new so they had to uh, transform the landscape of remembrance. The uh, monuments had to be uh, ordered to, um, or had to be erected where they were non-existent. Uh, ex exhibitions had to be supplemented, and the historiography had to be uh, constructed necessary to deconstruct various myths, as well as to understand the difference between the Lithuanian Jews and the Jews in Lithuania in order to create a certain ethos of Holocaust remembrance. And uh, in order uh, to these efforts to bear fruit, and uh, this fruit would be a growing empathy and a richer historical imagination and a deeper uh, general cognition of the forms of the human behavior. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, Mr. Vitkus for, for this nice presentation coverage about uh, the um, mem commemoration of Holocaust in the Soviet Union until uh, 1989. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question to yes, Mr. Zygmus? Of the conference, do you have any comments or questions related with uh, Zygmus Vitkus presentation? 
In that case, I would uh, uh, exercise my right as, an, as a moderator. Mr. Digmus, you mentioned in your presentation several pieces of literature uh, that uh, produce an effect upon the historical culture of Lithuania, and I would like to mention several writers that are non, not only in Lithuania but also uh, uh, worldwide, um, Meres and Kanovicius. So I'm not sure whether you uh, studied them, but uh, if you did, would you like to share your ideas uh, with us, uh, whether the uh, ideas and approaches of Meres and Kanovicius was unique in, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union or or there were other uh, papers um, in other places of the Soviet Union that that uh, had that, that approach towards the commemoration. In Lithuania, uh, the book of Meras uh, was unique. Um, undoubtedly, at the same time, the Soviet Union uh, also witnessed publication uh, of a quite impression uh, works. It's like uh, Yevtushenko poem about Babi Yar and uh, other uh, poems and novels which uh, show that the uh, atmosphere in general is, uh, was becoming freer and uh, showing that uh, uh, the subject matter was opening uh, gradually. Uh, concerning the other republics of all former Soviet republics, I wasn't really studying, but uh, uh, just uh, some sporadic appearances of different um, yeah, our papers and poems. And speaking about uh, um, effect upon the society, I, I'm not quite sure it is really possible to measure the, that the level or the extent of that effect, no matter how large the circulation of the papers is. Uh, normally, that uh, Soviet um, policy uh, in the post-war period uh, was uh, um, explained or interpreted that it was kind of um, the self-initiative of local government, uh, that the uh, Soviet government was um, was subordinated to the German occupants. Um, so it's not really it's not really the uh, general policy, but it was kind of uh, attempt to uh, attempt to uh, play that uh, Zionistic uh, card, um, and that was actually um, um, the same situation was even before war. So, whether, did you did you have a chance to meet any document or any evidence that it was generally the Moscow policy uh, in general rather than uh, the policy by the local uh, public authorities? No, I actually I don't. I, I I never had a chance to find a document like this. But uh, Suslov was very unhappy with that kind of liberal approach towards the uh, Holocaust issue. So I, I would assume that there was some kind of freedom of maneuver because so we opened the museum and the, and, uh, the prayers in synagogue and so on. I, I really don't have any comparative analysis about the situation in other republics at the time. <coughs> Mm -hmm. 
No po polsku można. Od kiedy i czy w ogóle znane są no, diariusze? Mm. I would like to ask, uh, are you familiar with the, with the papers of Sokovic, uh, with the material about the cross in Paneri? In Poland, we know a lot about uh, um, Paneri and about the massacre in Paneri. And actually, uh, the text of Sokovic was published about 20 years ago. So my question is, uh, is, uh, is this uh, 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 familiar to Lithuanian uh, uh, scholars? Yes, uh, we are very, very well known to Lithuanian uh, researchers. Uh, it's quite popular. But I wouldn't say some kind of um, iconic uh, paper. It's quite late. Uh, it was published, what, 20 years ago. I, I remember that there were several issues of the same publication, and it's uh, quite a new thing. So we know that Rodzina Panarska, that is an organization in Poland, was uh, active for some 20 years from 1990. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that that um, narrative or that text, that paper is very widely known in Lithuania. Mm, now I would like to um, express my gratitude to Mr. Dr. Zygmunt Vitkus uh, participating in the Section 3. Uh, in Section 3, uh, to all the speakers of the section, the participants of the conference, and uh, other, those who are following us uh, streamed on uh, the Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook stream in English, I would like to inform that now the conference conference is making a break and we'll be back at 2.30 Lithuanian time and uh, we'll be speaking about the competition of mem memories in an open society. See you later after the lunch.